In the last video, I showed how I built a high five counter by retraining an existing deep neural network. I went from basically nothing to something that runs in about two hours, which is pretty awesome. But simply getting a model that can classify your data isn't the end of the deep learning workflow. Some other things that we need to consider are that the trained network is usually part of a larger system, and we wanna be able to incorporate it into the complete design. We also want to have some amount of confidence that the model will work on unseen data and that it's going to interact as expected with the other system components. And ultimately, we want to deploy it onto a target device, which requires certain performance characteristics. And each of these require additional work and considerations beyond what I did in the last video. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. We can sum up this video with a question. I have a trained network. What's next? And before we get into it, I want to just reiterate my usual caveat that this video isn't intended to cover everything. I just want to introduce some concepts and get you thinking about the overall problem. And I've left links in the description to resources that go into far more depth on all of this. All right, let's get to it. At the end of the last video, we were left with a Google Net model that was retrained to recognize two patterns. It's looking for these pink volcanoes and classifying them as high fives, and then anything else we send through the network gets classified as no high fives. So what's next? Well, I think it's reasonable to want to know whether the network works or not. And we know that it works in some fashion because during the training process, it was using 40 validation images to assess the model accuracy, and it only mislabeled one out of the 40. And this is great for sure, but there's two things that I want to point out. The first is that even though we have some confidence that this model works for the 40 validation images, we don't necessarily know that it works on images that haven't been seen yet. Now, if those 40 validation images does a good job of covering the entire solution space, then we could be confident that the network will only come across situations that are similar to one of these images. However, in this case, 40 images was enough to gain confidence for the video I was making, but I don't think it was enough to cover all of the possible arm motions that the network might see in real life. And so we're gonna to wanna to do some additional testing if we're gonna deploy this network into the field. The second thing I want to point out with this model is that we validated it with scalagram images that are uncorrelated to each other. And what I mean is that each one comes from its own standalone arm motion. But that's not quite the case with how I'm going to use this network. Remember, I'm looking to pass in essentially a continuous stream of scalagrams, and I want to count the number of high fives in my data. That means that as the data streaks across the window, I'm going to pass in multiple frames with the exact same high five in it. And my network is going to return a high five label several times in a row. And beyond that, due to the errors in this network, that was the one out of 40 that it mislabels, some of these frames are going to be mislabeled. And both of these things will cause my counter to be off if I just assume each scalagram that is labeled a high five is actually its own unique motion. So the neural network is just part of the overall logic that I need for my counter. And this is almost certainly the case for all deep neural network solutions. You're going to develop a model that can classify data. And you, know, you obviously want to know that that works. But beyond that, there's other logic that makes that network an actual product. And it's important that the system as a whole works as well. Now, my project was rather simple and the stakes were pretty low if it didn't function correctly, but let me walk through the way I approached building out the rest of the high five counting logic. I built a MATLAB script that would read in the acceleration data and then keep the most current 1.4 seconds of data in a buffer. And then every third sample time, I'd pre-process the buffered data into a scalagram and then make sure that there were no pixel values greater than one and then run it through the trained network with the classify function. Then I only counted a new high five if it had been more than 1.4 seconds since the last high five. This is how I ensured that I only counted each high five a single time since it would have completely left the buffer before I look for a new one. 
And I did this in MATLAB because I only needed a few lines of code for this project, but this whole thing could have been developed in Simulink as well. Here is a Simulink version of my high five counter. Well, it's almost exactly the same. The difference is that rather than read the acceleration live, I've opted to just read in a five second acceleration profile that I saved off earlier. The idea being that I could collect several of these five second snippets where I know exactly how many high fives are in that data and then use them in regression tests whenever I update the network or the other logic. And other than that, the rest of this logic is doing the exact same thing. I'm updating the acceleration buffer, pre-processing it into a scalogram, classifying it with my trained network, and then counting the number of high fives. So let's open up the scope and run it so you can see it in action. The top graph is showing the red in acceleration profile, which has a single high five right here at the beginning. The counter only registers a single high five as expected, even though you can see that several scalograms were labeled as high fives as that pink volcano was streaking across the image. And the other thing to note here is that there's a delay between the actual high five and when it was counted. And this is due to the fact that my network was trained to recognize the high five when it was in the middle of the image or a few tenths of a second after it occurred. All right, so now what's nice about Simulink is that I can package this logic into its own subsystem and I can use it as part of an even larger system. Like for example, this model shows the implementation of a multi-loop PI controller acting on a robotic arm. And maybe if I was so inclined, I could use my new subsystem to determine if this robotic arm ever made a motion that looked like a high five. And once I was happy with this implementation, I could use Simulink Coder to build embedded C code and deploy all of this logic, including my deep neural network to the arm itself. Now, I'm not actually gonna build this out any further because I'm just making a video to demonstrate a few things. But if I did wanna keep going on this project, my next steps would be to systematically try all of the different arm motions I could think of, both high fives and non high five motions. And I'd probably even have other people try it out from different cultures that might high five differently. And every instance where the user motion was misclassified by the system, I would save off that data and add it to my training data set to retrain and refine the network. Now, in this way, I'm never guaranteed to have a perfectly functioning network, but I am increasing the solution space over which I'm confident that it will perform. And this is a standard approach for deep neural networks. We don't yet have a good systematic way to verify them. So we rely on these sampling methods like Monte Carlo approaches to gain confidence in the network over the entire solution space. And this is more than likely going to be the case for your project as well. Whether you're looking for material defects or picking out verbal commands in audio or classifying RF modulation schemes. You're going to integrate the trained neural network into your full system and test it in a variety of situations. But as you can see, no matter how many different tests I run, there will always be sections of the solution space that haven't been tested. And so this is where synthesized data can be so powerful. Remember, in the second video where we synthesized RF data, and the idea there was that we would use it for training a network, well, now we can use it to generate millions of different test cases and produce a really dense sampling of the solution space. And that would just give us a huge amount of confidence in the system. Well, you know, as long as the synthesized data actually reflected reality. Now, I can't really do that with my high five project because I don't have a good understanding of the acceleration patterns that are possible with high fives and therefore can't easily synthesize it. For my project, it was easier to just physically test it rather than synthesize the test data. But regardless of whether you can synthesize test data or not, you're gonna to want to ultimately test the system in the real world on the real hardware. Which brings me to the other thing I wanna talk about, deploying your network and other code to a target computer. Deployment is important because it doesn't matter if your code works, if it doesn't work on the hardware it's supposed to run on. And there's a bunch of good information that I link to in the description on generating optimized code for deep learning networks directly from MATLAB and Simulink for embedded GPUs, CPUs, and FPGAs. So I'm not gonna go through that here. 
Instead, I want to take the last few minutes to talk specifically about the size and speed of the trained network. For a high five counter that's going to be deployed to an embedded CPU on a watch, it's important that the size of the network is taken into account. I started from Google Net, which if I open up the Deep Network Designer app, I can quickly get a sense of the size of this network. This neural network has 7 million parameters, which is pretty massive for a simple high five counting program. Now, if memory space or execution speed is a concern, then I'm going to have to find a way to make this smaller. And there are a few options. For one, I could just start from a smaller pre-trained network, something like SqueezeNet, which only has just over a million parameters, and then again use transfer learning to retrain it for high fives. The idea would be that maybe I don't need the accuracy or feature details that the larger Google Net provides. And here I did the exact same transfer learning steps that we took in the last video, and I retrained SqueezeNet. And at least for these particular parameters, this network is 90% accurate. So a little less accurate than Google Net. Now I can export the retrain squeeze net to the workspace and run it in my MATLAB or Simulink simulation. But check this out. We can see that this million parameter network is still about three megabytes. And if this size is still a problem, Instead of finding an even smaller pre-trained network, I could also try reducing the size of my network by pruning it or quantizing it. Pruning is removing some of the parameters in the network that don't contribute much to classifying your particular data. And quantizing means taking the single or double precision weights and biases in your network and quantizing them to 8-bit scaled integer data types. The idea is that we can still get the same performance from the network without having to use high precision data types. Just to give you a sense of what reducing the network could look like in one instance, let me show you the results of quantizing my trained network. Here I'm using the Deep Network Quantizer app to pull in my trained model and then quantize it to 8-bit scaled integers. Now, this took a few minutes to run, which I'm skipping over, but the important metric here is that the network was compressed by 75% and it had no measurable impact on its accuracy. So it has the same number of parameters, but it's one quarter the memory size. And in addition to this, I could also try pruning the network to reduce the number of parameters in a way that also doesn't impact accuracy, but I'm going to leave this model as is for now. And hopefully you can start to see that with a pre-trained network and transfer learning and pruning and quantizing, you might be able to get to a model that is sufficient size and efficiency for your application. But if you can't, then the last option is to build your own network architecture from scratch. This option requires the most training data and the most training time, since at the beginning, the network has no concept of anything, so it has to learn everything. And the other downside of starting from scratch is that it takes a good understanding of different network architectures to create an efficient one. But this is where trade-offs can occur. How much specialized development do you need to do from scratch versus how efficient and fast do you need your architecture to be? My high five counter might benefit from a smaller and specialized architecture since it has to be deployed to an embedded processor on a watch. Whereas a system that is looking for material defects could run on a dedicated desktop computer with a GPU. And it may not even need to run real time if getting instantaneous results back is not necessary. So I guess the one thing I want you to take away from this is that there are things you need to consider with deep learning. Some of those things are how deep does the network need to be in order to be able to find and classify the patterns in your data? And can you get by with a pre-trained network and transfer learning? And how are you going to access labeled training data? And how will you ensure that the data covers the entire solution space? In general, you're going to need more training data to train larger networks and to train networks from scratch. And then, how are you going to gain confidence in your network and in the system as a whole? And can you synthesize test data and can you run simulations? Or does all testing need to be done in the field? And there's no one answer for every project, but hopefully you can start to see the benefits and possibilities for deep learning. Perhaps you have an engineering problem that you're working right now, where the solution comes down to being able to detect and label complex patterns in data. If so, 
Deep learning is an approach you might want to consider as part of your trade studies. It might be easier than you think. All right, that's where I'm going to leave this video for now. Don't forget to check out the resources that I left in the description of this video. There's a lot of good stuff there. And if you don't want to miss any other Tech Talk video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Also, if you want to check out my channel, Control System Lectures, I cover more control theory topics there as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.